Meanwhile, there is also news back in the United States involving the leading candidate on the Republican side for president, one Donald J. Trump. And this uh, news is a lesson, in fact, for all of you who would like to be attorneys, for you to be, want to be lawyers. There is no legal value in letting your client take part in your closing arguments. Don't do it. It will not work out in your favor. Now, if you don't agree, just look to the dramatic scenes out of a New York City courtroom today where closing arguments were made in Donald Trump's civil fraud trial. Following Judge Arthur and Goron's decision yesterday not to allow Trump to speak, given that he would not follow the rules imposed on everyone else. Trump's lawyers asked again at the end of their closing arguments to allow Trump just a few minutes to speak. Surprisingly, the judge agreed. Unsurprisingly, Trump very quickly went down the path that the judge told him not to go. Trump went on the attack against New York Attorney General Letitia James, saying she hates Trump and is just conducting a political witch hunt. He claimed the case is election interference and that she should be paying him for damages. Trump also went on to attack the judge, claiming that he had his own agenda. And just remember, there's no jury in this trial. It's the judge who's going to be ruling in this case, which... He said today that he is trying to do before the end of the month. It's a ruling that has the potential to cause Trump both great financial and reputational harm. The judge has already ruled that Trump and his co-defendants, including his eldest sons, are liable for fraud, for inflating the value of their various properties. What is yet to be determined by Judge Ngoron is what financial penalties Trump will have to face. Letitia James came into the case asking for $250 million in penalties, but has since upped that to $370 million. She's also asked for a lifetime ban for Trump from the real estate industry in New York. At the end of the day, the point is simple. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how rich you are, that no one is above the law and that the law applies to all of us equally and fairly. Perhaps this is why the case has appeared to have gotten under Trump's orange tinted skin more than any other, with Trump repeatedly lashing out in public and on social media against the state attorney general, the judge, and even the judge's clerk, which resulted in a gag order against him. And Trump's rhetoric has had real world consequences. Just this morning, hours before the start of the closing arguments, Judge Ngoron faced a bomb threat at his home. Joining me now is MSNBC reporter Adam Reese, who was in the courtroom today, and Charles Coleman Jr., former Brooklyn prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst. Gentlemen, thank you for being here and for sitting through our breaking news. You got here on an exciting night. So we're going to make this turn to talk about uh, what happened in court today. You were there, Adam. Tell us what went on. Well, we started out with the defense making their argument. Again, same argument that we've heard over the past 44 days. No fraud, no victims. Michael Cohen, the prosecution's lead, uh, lead witness, is a convicted liar. We should actually be praising Mr. Trump. He should get a medal. Uh, everything that Mr. Trump did was right. Uh, and then they went on and on and on. Mr. Trump had the opportunity. He spoke. It was the same thing. He said, I am innocent. I, I should be uh, compensated. I am the victim of fraud here. The prosecution, they had their chance to speak. They said more of the same, that essentially, uh, you know, Donald Trump loves to talk about how rich he is, that banks love how rich he is, that they were actually begging him to let them loan him money, that they were rolling out the red carpet. Um, but there was intent to fraud, to defraud. The evidence is there. And if you don't see it, your head's buried in the sand. And you know, the thing is, I, look, I'm not a lawyer, but even I know if you represent yourself, you have a fool for a client. Have you ever, as a prosecutor, seen a defendant in a case, particularly when there's no jury? There's no jury to convince here. There's nobody. It's the judge that gets to decide. Have you ever heard of a defendant in a case like this deciding to give part of the closing argument? No, Joy, and this is as bizarre as it is consistent with everything that we continue to see out of Trump world here on Earth One, where everyone continues to operate on Earth Two in that sort of camp. Even if you had a client who wanted to testify and you thought that that was a bad idea and you still allowed that client to exercise their right to testify during a closing argument, you are absolutely not allowing your client to leave that judge or that jury with the final impression of what it is that your case represents, particularly if you know or have any inkling that that client is going to get on the stand and get in front of the, and get in the well and gesticulate and berate the court officers and berate right. 
the judge and berate the entire justice system that is responsible for conducting this hearing that you are an officiant of as a lawyer, you're never going to do that. So, yes, this is really absurd. It's really bizarre, but it's also very consistent. And the thing is, it, it, there's a possibility, again, that, that, you know, coming at this from a non-lawyer's point of view, I could foresee Donald Trump saying, I'm going to appeal if he is gets That's a five hundred million dollar, uh, you know, judgment against him and say they didn't let me speak. Well, mm -hmm. he's killed that now because they did let him speak. Right. So in a way, did he undermine one of the few things he might have had on appeal? Well, I don't necessarily know it was that. I think it was more so that the judge made a conscious decision to take away, as you already talked about, an argument that he could have had. It, he didn't undermine him because he has a history, as you've seen over and over again, in various jurisdictions. I'm going to put pressure on the refs because if they make a bad call from the bench, I now have an issue that I can move on appeal and try to collect and try to delay, 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 because that's ultimately what I want to do. Judge Ngoran said... I'm not going to give you that option here. I'm going to allow you your time to speak, right. and you're going to walk into a hole, and I'm going to give you enough rope, and you're going to hang yourself. What was the? How did the judge's sort of demeanor sort of change as he was hearing these attacks, including on himself? Well, you know, the judge has always been amenable um, originally to let him speak, yeah. and there was this intense. Um, wild exchange of emails earlier this week. The judge was going to let him speak. It was a back and forth. He gave him three chances. He finally said, now or never, you need to decide, are you going to agree to these restrictions that right. I'm putting in place? And when Mr. Trump started to speak, by the way, Judge Engeron was laying out the restrictions and Mr. Trump did not let him even finish. He just launched into his diatribe. It got to the point where the judge said, Mr. Kyes, you need to control your client. It was the end of that, and they were out of the now, room. Chris Kyes, by, by the way, for the, those of you who don't remember all of the playing cards here, he's the guy who got the $3 million or $2 million up front mm -hmm. to represent Donald Trump. Uh, did, did, did you get the sense, and could you tell, if the idea for him to speak was his idea or the lawyer's? Because I cannot imagine it was Chris Kyes' idea. Right. He, all, all along, it's, it's him making the calls. And in those emails that I just referred to, yeah. you could see in the writing. There was almost a cut and paste. This was not Chris Kai speaking. Yeah. This was Donald Trump speaking, um, referring to this prosecution. It's a political witch hunt. They're performing for him. How high do you think this uh, could end up going? I mean, the, the, you know, Letitia James has now gone up to 370. Could it go higher? I don't necessarily know if it goes higher, but I do think it's going to go higher than where we initially started. I think that Donald Trump's defense team was very smart to invoke language around corporate death penalty because what that's intended to do is to get the judge to back off just a little bit because he's worried about that judgment being appealed for being too draconian or too severe. Now, that being said, I do think that we could see an upwards of $300 million, which would be very, very bad for the Trump organization. Sure. But I don't know that we're going to get to 270. I think we will be higher than where Letitia James started, but not as high as she is now. Let, let's put up the, the, the list of other things <laughs> that are coming up, like Donald Donald Trump still has um, this case. You still have the uh, appeals court in the DC, the D.C. appeals court case, right, that he has to deal with of whether or not he has absolute immunity. You've got this uh, question of whether, I mean, I can't even remember all of it. He's got also you've got Miami, Miami. You've got hush money. You've got D.C. Uh, E.G. Carroll, e. Carroll. Atlanta. If you listen really carefully, what you'll hear in the distance is the pathetic silence that indicates the complete capitulation of the entire Republican establishment to Donald Trump. From the network that paid out $787 million for peddling his election lies to the people pretending to run for president against him. If you were fortunate enough to miss Trump's town hall with Iowa voters last night, fear not, you didn't miss much other than the decaf version of the all but certain Republican presidential nominee who got an opportunity to sound almost normal with an assist from the friendly host at Fox. Although Trump did get plenty of chances to prove that he's exactly as dangerous as he seems, as he did some low energy autocratting, sidestepping a question about political violence by claiming he'd be too busy for retribution against his enemies, but that it wouldn't be too bad if he did. And he tried to explain away his pledge to be a dictator on day one by blaming the media. The and courts. the press picks it up. So I said, I'm going to be a dictator for one day. They cut it. They go, I'm going to be a dictator. But they cut the rest of the sentence. No, no, I am not going to be a dictator. Or he could have just let Sean Hannity bail him out the first time, since now it seems like he really means it. The version of Trump seemingly designed by Lachlan Murdoch to be palatable enough to put on late on live TV 
did drop the veil long enough to remind people of color and women exactly who he is. He vowed to create the largest deportation effort in history if he's elected president again. And he bragged about the work of his right wing Supreme Court. For 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it. And I'm proud to have done it. We did it. And we did something that was a miracle. Trump followed that line about the miracle with a lie about killing babies after birth, which is not a real thing ever. That also got no pushback from the Fox anchors, of course. Meanwhile, the two Republicans trying to remain relevant in the race spent the night going after not the arsonist atop the Republican field, no, no, but rather at each other, which our producers have helpfully summarized for you as follows. We don't need another mealy mouth politician who just tells you what she thinks you want to hear. But every time he lies, Drake University, don't turn this into a drinking game because you will be overserved by the end of the night. Uh, she's got this problem with ballistic podiatry, uh, shooting herself in the foot every other day. He can call me whatever name and be demeaning as much as he wants. It doesn't change the fact that Ron's lying because Ron's losing. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the MAGA party has long since moved on, with his MAGA crony cronies throwing everything at the wall to soothe Trump's fragile little ego by trying, with no evidence, mind you, to make President Biden even Stephen with Trump on impeachment. On Wednesday, two House committees passed resolutions recommending contempt of Congress charges against the president's son, Hunter Biden. Even though Hunter Biden was very much present for one of those hearings yesterday, where Democrats called out Republicans for their lies. The witness accepted the chairman's invitation. It just so happens the witness is here. Let's take a vote. Who wants to hear from Hunter right now, today? Anyone? Come on. Who wants to hear from Hunter? No one. For some reason, it makes sense to hold Hunter Biden in contempt, who has tried to comply. And let me tell you why nobody wants to talk to y'all behind closed doors, because y'all lie. That's just the bottom line. Joining me now is Maria Teresa Kumar, president of Bodo Latino and an MSNBC contributor and MSNBC political analyst, David Jolly, who served in Congress as a Republican before leaving the party. And I still cannot figure out why, why he's no longer associated with the party. <sighs> let me, let, I don't even know where to begin, but I will start with you, MTK. Um, how do you hold someone in contempt for violating a subpoena when they're literally sitting right there? Oh, I think they were surprised and they said, wait a second, he's still there, but I have my talking points. They can't work off the cuff, which is clear. And so they weren't actually able to adapt in the, in the manner that they needed to. But I think this brings up to a larger issue is that they are trying desperately to pin something, anything on the president, even if, the, even if it's his son. And by doing so, it's because they recognize that Trump is such a liability, especially when we saw what happened today in the court, where basically Tisha James is saying, not only make sure that he has to pay a $370 billion fine, but at the same, three, I'm sorry, $370 million fine, but at the same time, make sure that he can no longer conduct business as a Trump affiliate in his offices ever again in New York City. And that's huge. And the Republican Congress, they understand that. And that's why this whole thing is a complete ruse against Hunter Biden. It's embarrassing, David, because, you, you know, first of all, they're saying this guy's in contempt of Congress because he wouldn't come and go before a behind closed doors meeting with us because he wants to testify in public, which you'd think they'd want if they had anything on the president. That's number one. And number two, as Eric Swalwell pointed out, they've got members who refused subpoenas. You know, what, 600 <laughs> some odd days later, Jim Jordan is still in defiance of a congressional subpoena. How can you say we want our subpoenas to be, uh, you know, you, we want you to comply with our subpoenas when we ourselves don't comply with subpoenas? Because it's re it's the Republicans. Hypocrisy <laughs> is their currency. Um, so look, I, I think what we're seeing in the Hunter Biden, uh, you know, strategy, if you will, is he is clearly subscribing to the notion that if you can't win the process, win the story. And so he's not going to win the process. Republicans have the votes, but he can win the story, which is exactly what we're talking about. This is someone who's trying to comply. I think we're also seeing a legal strategy. You know, one of the things that that Abby Lowell said is. They sent five different letters to the committee saying, we will do it this way or how about this way? And they got no response. Congress is going to hold Hunter Biden in contempt 
and make a criminal referral to the Department of Justice. DOJ doesn't really want to take criminal referrals for contempt of Congress, but they especially don't want to take this one, where we have now publicly seen Hunter Biden try to comply. This is a legal defense, but it also is a, a political and public defense saying, I might lose the process, but I'm going to win this story. Right. And I mean, Marie Jessica Kumar, they're already saying that they're going to send this referral to uh, the Justice Department. And if uh, Merrick Garland doesn't prosecute Hunter Biden for contempt of Congress. They're going to impeach him. They're going to impeach Mayorkas over the border. They're going to impeach Joe Biden. They've got a long list of impeachments. Democrats have described it as like the Oprah Winfrey strategy. You get an impeachment and you get an impeachment and you get an impeachment. They're going to impeach everybody. And this is what they're going to take to their voters and say, this is why you should reelect us. I mean, I, I personally don't get it, but is there some base out there that says this is what they want? Not, I don't know, roads, bridges, Something right. Well, and I think I mean, but Joy, this is the this is a challenge. We keep trying to say that the Republicans are actually they are for something that the purpose of government is to actually fix it. But for many of them, they want to drown government. They want to turn pe the American people off. They want to make it feel like it's icky and that you that government cannot do anything. So they are actually following a strategy. And while it will turn some of those folks on of their base, it'll turn a vast majority of Americans off. And so we have to be very clear that it is a strategy because. You are absolutely right. There's so many issues that are facing us right now as a country that we should be tackling. And instead of doing that, they're obfuscating and they're dragging their feet because they don't want to do the tough things. And that's policy and engage in policy changing for betterment of the American people. Yeah. And David Jolly, can we just spare a, a thought for Chris Christie here, who, you know, give him credit. Look, you know, Lawrence O'Donnell, he, he had us giggling last night saying that he this is the one time he actually had respect for Chris Christie. But I have to say, I do respect what he's tried to do. He is a lonely voice that speaks very plainly in plain spoken language about what Trump is, because he knows the man. He said he's known him for 25 years. He knows that he's a crook. He knows he doesn't care about his base at all. What do you think he winds up doing? Because he has said that he's going to do everything he can to prevent Trump from being elected president again. What can he do? Who's his audience? Yeah, I think he possibly ends up speaking at the DNC, endorsing Joe Biden and hitting the campaign trail for him. That certainly reflect his words. Now, I think we have to look at Chris Christie's trajectory over the last decade. I mean, he he endorsed Donald Trump initially uh, back in the first race. He led his transition team. He thought he might be vice president. When that didn't work out, things got a little sour. But the one thing you've got to give him credit for is he has been perfectly consistent this race. He was running to be a foil to Donald Trump and to say that Donald Trump is a danger to the country. Well, if Donald Trump is a danger to the country and he is the Republican nominee, then Chris Christie better support Joe Biden publicly or he will be back having his credentials question. Yeah. I hope he joins the coalition that supports the re-election of the president. We will see. Uh, and then the other issue, uh, MTK, well, the two issues. Republicans want one and don't want the other. The one they want is immigration. They are doing brown scare again. So far, this does not seem to have cost them as many Latino votes as one might think, because there is somewhat of a base inside of, you know, the, the Latino base that's for Republicans and Trump. And then there's the abortion one, which they don't want any piece of. Donald Trump tried to kind of walk a line with it and sound reasonable about it. But this is a losing issue for them. Women are going to die. Women are already dying. It's a problem. How do those two issues, you think, play into this election year? So I think, you know, one of the things that we keep talking about in the media is that there is a that Latinos are shifting Republican and the data joy just doesn't doesn't add up quite, uh, quite frankly. During the midterm elections, what we saw from Pew was that there was a dip in Latino turnout. Mm. And the people that turned out were were Republican because they did get reached out to. So this is an opportunity for the Democrats to say, if you want to win, you're going to make sure that Latinos that have supported you historically continue to support you at record level. And that means talking to them and investing in them. And to your point, the immigration that's happening at the border, that's not an immigration issue. That's a crisis. And Latino communities all around the country, they want safe borders as well. But you know what they also want? They want to make sure that their loved ones that were essential workers that made sure that we were thriving mm -hmm. during the during COVID, that their families all of a sudden can come out of the shadows if they were undocumented and actually get 
relief. That's a domestic policy issue. And the Republicans don't want to touch that because they know that even moderate independent Republicans mm -hmm. believe that someone who's been paying taxes here for 20, 30 years, they too deserve a shot at the American dream in a fair, square way. Yeah, I also think that that whole abortion issue is absolutely a loser. And he knows that's why Trump knows that. And the yeah. Republicans are trying to backpedal. But that's too late. Uh, absolutely. And a national abortion ban. I don't know how they think that's the answer. That doesn't even make sense.